make a few videos, put them into parts, about Mystery Babylon the Great. I've had some live chats discussing this with others, and everybody seems to think it's the Vatican. I don't see the Vatican at all. So I want to explain why I don't believe it's the Vatican. So this first video, I'm just going to make it real short while I'm making the other videos. But in, in this video, I just want to show why I don't think it's the Vatican. We'll just begin with some of the discussion that I was in and the points that they were making uh, to tell me why they believe it can only be the Vatican. And the first one was their robes, their garments were purple and scarlet. Okay, so let's look at that. We read in Revelation 17, it talks about this great whore that sitteth upon many waters, to whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness in her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. Okay, let's stop right there and just look at this for a second. Everything we read here is symbolic. This is symbology. The seven angels, which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. Now, is this a, a literal whore who goes around sleeping with physical people? I mean, is this, this whore, is she really sitting on water? Is she just, you know, wet? Um, this talks about the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, um, and she's drunk with the wine. So she, is she literally drunk, sitting in water? It's all symbology. You read on down, and he carried me where in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. So is this woman literally sitting on a red beast and as full of names of blasphemy? Having seven heads and ten horns, does this is this a real physical animal? This beast, does it really have seven heads and ten horns? Um, does she have on her forehead, literally, does it written on her forehead, mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, abomination? Is any of this literal? And the answer, you know, is no. So why out of this whole thing, this is all just symbology do they want to take scarlet and purple and make it literal that's taking things out of context so you read it you know it's symbology but then they say well the pope the pope they dress up in purple and scarlet so that must be what that is that must be it got it that's ridiculous to me. That's not what it's saying. This is all symbology. So out of all this, you don't take one thing and make it literal, and knowing that the whole context is spiritual symbology. And then I'm told that that's the Vatican's colors. And I won't get into this too much, but I just want to show you that it's not, it did not come from the Vatican. This goes back to Moses and Aaron. And as you can see here in Exodus 28, Aaron's clothes, Moses' brother, were made of purple and scarlet. This is what God told them to use. Purple and scarlet. scarlet. They shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. Uh, Exodus 28, 6. 
purple and scarlet, and fine linen, an ephod of gold, Exodus 28, 8. We have gold, blue, purple, and scarlet, fine linen. I'm just, I just want you to see all the times that they use purple and scarlet and gold and fine linen. Blue, Exodus 28, 15. More purple, scarlet, fine twine linen. Exodus 28, 33. Blue, purple, scarlet. Exodus 39, purple and scarlet. They made clothes of service to do service in the holy place and made the holy garments for Aaron as the Lord commanded Moses. Um, Exodus 39, 2. He made the ephod of gold, blue and purple and scarlet and fine twine linen. Next verse, purple and scarlet. Cunning work. Exodus 39, 24. And the hems of the robe, they had purple and scarlet. And the girdle, purple and scarlet, of needlework, as the Lord commanded Moses. But I don't even worry about that, because I know chapter 17 of Revelation, when it's talking about the woman on the beast, and this, it's all symbolic. And then they say that the Vatican City is the city that was built on seven hills. It's got to be the Vatican. Right? No. Because the Vatican City is built on Vatican Hill. And Vatican Hill is not even part of the seven hills of Rome that it was built on. The seven hills of Rome are on the east side of the Tiber River. The Vatican City is on the west side of Tiber River, on Vatican Hill, which would make that eight hills, if that was even a part of it. So that's not even true. That doesn't fit Babylon the Great. God's words are perfect, and his prophecy, when he sees the future, is perfect. There is no discrepancies at all. And so... A couple have said in the past that, well, Vatican is a part of Rome. Well, no, it's not. Actually, Vatican is a sovereign city. And if you read here, you can look it up yourself. Vatican City is sovereign of the state of Vatican City. So they're actually sovereign. They are their own. And also, if you go to somewhere like Wikipedia or there's several places. This is just easier to read. It even says the Vatican City, parentheses, the smallest country in the world. It is an independent country inside the city boundaries of Rome, the only existing example of a country within a city. For this reason, Rome has been often defined as capital of two states. And the biggest problem with this it doesn't say hills. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. It's not hills. A mountain is not a hill. The Bible talks about mountains. Most of the time, it's talking about a kingdom. And I'll pull up all these verses we can go through. Whenever it talks about a mountain, he's talking about a kingdom. So you can read it in Daniel 2.35 when he talks about the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Well, we know Christ is that rock that's going to come smashing that statue down at the feet. And when that stone hits, which is Christ, when he comes down, it says right here, he became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. <laughs> that's Christ, his kingdom come on earth, and it filled the whole earth. Let's keep going. Amos 4.1. Hear this word, you kind of Bashan, that are in the mountain of Samaria, which oppress the poor, which crush the needy, which say to the masters, bring and let us drink. What is that saying? It's talking about a kingdom, the mountain of Samaria, because we know the mountain literally don't oppress the poor and it doesn't crush the needy 
which would be pretty scary. The mountain came crushing things. You can read more in Amos 6 1. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations. Obadiah 1 16. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain. Okay, are we really going to be drinking on a mountain? No. It's, it's talking about his kingdom. Obadiah 121. And Savior shall come upon Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Okay. We're going to come on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. Are we going to judge an actual mountain? No, he says it right there in the next line. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. And you can do that study real quick on your own. Just look at mountains all throughout the Bible, and you'll get the context of most of it is talking of kingdoms. And the next point I want to make is this golden cup in her hand. That people are saying it's the chalice that the Pope is holding. There's a lot of pictures that kept popping up and people pointing to this thing. Well, here in Revelation 17, 4, it says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet in color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So again, this is not literal, it's symbolic. And I'll show you right here. And we'll just let the Bible interpret itself. Jeremiah 25:15. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink and be moved, and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then took I the cup at the Lord's hand, and made all the nations to drink unto them whom the Lord had sent me. So you see there that this cup that the Lord is passing out to all the nations to drink it, it's the same cup. Jeremiah 51, 7. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken her of her wine. Therefore the nations are mad. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. That is not the same cup that the Pope is holding in his hand. And I have a lot more to share um, on my studies of this. And this whole thing with the Vatican, I'm not seeing it. I don't see the Vatican, Rome, the Catholics. I don't see them in here at all. This is huge. We've got two whole chapters in the book of Revelation about Mystery Babylon, the Great. And some into the 19th chapter as well. Um, so this is huge. And if you've been paying attention to what I've been showing you, do your own study. But so far, none of this fits the Vatican. This is stuff that we were taught. This stuff has been taught from theologians of old. Back, I think, they started in 13, uh, 313 A.D. So they couldn't have seen the future nations. They couldn't see who is in power today. But I'm not going to get into that. I just wanted to show you why there's a lot of problems if you're going to say it's the Vatican. But I'm going to get off here and I'll put out my next video as soon as I can. And uh, thanks for listening. All glory to God. Praise Him and Amen.